So, the talk I'm going to do today is an elegy in four parts, and the first part is called The Pirates. There is a group of powerful anti-copyright activists out there who are trying to destroy the book. Pirates who would destroy copyright and who have no respect for property. Oh, they dress up this in high-minded rhetoric about how they are the true defenders and inheritors of creativity. And they sell that claim around the world, even to regulators. They back congressmen, they back parliamentarians. They say that they want to preserve the way it's always been, and they claim that their radical agenda is somehow conservative. What they really see is a future in which ebook markets grow by leaps and bounds, and they always get to be at the center of it. They claim that they're in this for the ethics of it, but what they're really thinking about is profit. The pirates I'm talking about are not the kids who download ebooks without paying for them. It's not the librarians, and it's not Google. I'm talking about the publishers, whose extreme copyright positions threaten the book itself. Part two is called The People of the Book. We are the people of the book. We love our books. We fill our houses with books. We treasure the books we inherit from our parents, and we cherish the idea of passing them on to our children. We force worthy books on our friends, insisting that they read them. We feel a weird kinship with people we see reading the books that we love on the subway or, the, or an airplane. If anyone tries to take away our books, a repressive government or some prudish censor, a burglar, we defend them with everything we have. We know the other people of the book because they inhabit homes that are filled with books, given over to books, books that line their walls, books that are piled on their stairs, books that are next to the bed, even damp, swollen piles of books next to the toilet. <laughs> our books are us. They are our outward memory banks, and they contain the moral and intellectual and imaginative influences that made us the people that we are today. And copyright recognizes this. It says that once you buy the book, you own the book. It's yours to give away, it's yours to keep, it's yours to lend or borrow, to inherit, or to include in your estate. For centuries, copyright has acknowledged the sacred connection between readers and their books. Books, after all, are much older than copyright. Books are older than publishing. Books are older than printing. Books are older than binding. Books are older than paper. Books are certainly older than records or video games or CDs or DVDs. But the anti-copyright activists have no respect for the ancient property rights vested in books. They say that when you buy an ebook or a digital audiobook, you are demoted from being an owner to being a licensor, from being a reader to being a user. These thieves deliver our digital books and audiobooks wrapped in license agreements and proprietary technologies that might as well be designed to destroy that ancient emotional bond between people and books. These books come wrapped in licenses that run into thousands of words. In one example, if you buy a 20,000 word uh, audio novella from Audible in the United States using your iPhone on um, AT&T's network, in order to buy that 20,000 word novella, you must read and agree to 26,000 words of license agreement. The premise of those licenses is forget copyright. Forget whatever law was written by Parliament or Congress or the EU. From now on, we're making the rules. These licenses are filled with unenforceable claims and they're backstop with clauses like, in the event that some of this license is held to be unenforceable, the balance will remain in force. It's a way of saying, really, we didn't limit ourselves to the things that we can get away with in law. This is our farcical wish list of everything that we would charge you for. And if any part of it isn't enforceable, well, the rest of it sticks around. Copyright is nonsense, is what these licenses say. The words printed here have no relationship to copyright. And on top of those licenses, we get DRM, or TBMs. Now, DRM has never stopped anyone from uh, bringing a book from the physical world and putting it onto the internet, or from a protected ebook wrapper and putting it on the internet. To anyone who believes that DRM will stop ebooks from being translated into unprotected formats and freely circulated, I say, behold the typist. 
There has never been a time in which more people were situated to use either their fingers or their scanners to convert text into unencumbered text. DRM, instead of protecting works, makes it illegal for someone to create a reader that can display a book or play the audiobook because it's unlawful to translate books from one format to another if there's DRM on them, and it's unlawful to use them in some assistive format or an assistive device. Now, some EUCD implementations have narrow exceptions to this. In Norway, for example, you're allowed to break DRM in order to read the book with an, uh, with an assistive reader if you're blind or have another disability. But only you, the blind person, are allowed to do it, and you're not allowed to tell anyone else how to do it. So if you're a blind hacker who can convert your DRM crippled ebooks into something that you can read, you're allowed to, but you're not allowed to help any other blind people do it. Um, now, to understand what it means to reify DRM over copyright or over users' rights, think of this. Say that Amazon had a deal with IKEA that said that if you wanted to buy a book from Amazon, a physical book, you would have to buy the matching bookcase from Ikea and the light bulb and the chair to read it in. And it was against the law to buy a competitor's chair or light bulb or bookcase. And the state would use every euro in its coffers to prosecute anyone who made it possible to shelve that book on someone else's bookcase, to read it in someone else's chair, to read it by someone else's light bulb. Um, if they claimed this right, Amazon, publishers would never give it to them. They would laugh at it. They would withdraw their works from Amazon's store because it is not in the interest of writers or publishers or libraries or the public for readers to be held hostage by mere distributors who, if they can gain enough power, can use their login to dictate terms as the iTunes store uses login to dictate pricing and terms to the record industry. Part three of this talk is called Saving the Book. After years of writing and thinking about books, I've come to a simple and important realization. I really love books. Not just reading or owning them, I have an actual sentimental attachment to the idea of books, and I think it's one that's widely shared. Um, if you were making a student film and you needed to cheaply and quickly establish that in your film society has collapsed into barbarism, all you need to do is to show a pile of books on the fire. We, we think of libraries in our fiction and in our, in our stories as the pinnacle of civilization. If you want to read apocalyptic fiction, you'll always see that when they rebuild, they start by making libraries. It's how you know that civilization has come back. If you want to make a character sympathetic in fiction, you talk about how much they love books, how much they love going to libraries. There's a penumbra of virtue, it's fairly undeserved virtue, it must be said, given how many books are bad. There is a penumbra of virtue that surrounds books. I find it hard to recycle the phone book. When I worked in bookstores, I found it hard to tear the covers off of unsold paperbacks and send them back. Now, this is a fine place for publishing and writers to be. After all, publishers pay high-priced marketing people millions to design electronic experiences for their businesses. Uh, the experience of consuming and discussing books and so on which brings me to the second half of my realization. The most important part of the experience of the book is the emotional bond that comes from being able to own the book, to know that your children can inherit it, to know that it came from your parents, to know that it can be archived and lent or borrowed, to know that the magazines that you subscribe to uh, belong to you, even if you stop subscribing to them, to have your books there like old friends following you from house to house for all the days of your life. This is a literally invaluable asset, this penumbra of virtue that surrounds books. And yet publishing is squandering it, setting out to convince readers that they have no business treating books as property, that they shouldn't get attached to them. And publishing is very unlike, uh, unlucky, it might succeed. Which brings me to the fourth part of my talk, which is called Respect Copyright. People keep showing me e-reading devices and browsing uh, software that try to recreate the book experience with cute animations that show the pages turning and so on. But they never recreate the important part of owning an e -book, uh, owning a book, the important part of the book experience, the part that keeps people buying books for their whole lives, filling their walls with treasured friends they wouldn't part with for love nor money. Um, it's the ownership of books that's never present in these experiences. 
If I buy a physical book, it's mine. There is no mechanism, not even in the face of a court order, that the person who so whereby the person who sold me the book can be ordered to take it away from me. When I worked in a bookstore, no matter what you did, I never had the authority to come over to your house and take back the books that I sold to you. <laughs> and yet we've designed the most popular ebook readers so that books can be remotely deleted from them by the retailer in the face of a court order or in the face of some business decision. This is crazy. This ignores Anton Chekhov's first law of narrative that a gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1 is destined to go off by Act 3. You could not lay the ground for tyranny better than by doing this. If I buy audiobooks or CDs, they are mine. I can rip them to MP3 or WMA or AAC. I can play them on any player I own today or any player I buy tomorrow. And there is no license or DRM that prohibits this. But it's not true of audiobooks. 90% of English audiobooks sold through Audible with mandatory DRM. When my publisher, Bertelsmann, asked Audible to sell books without DRM, they said, we won't do it, and even if we would, iTunes wouldn't carry it. We love our books because they belong to us. They are our outward intellectual co-processors and our memory units, in which we store our inspiration, fantasy, and aspirations. Anyone who claims that readers can't and won't and shouldn't own their books is bent on nothing less than the destruction of the book, the destruction of publishing, and the destruction of authorship. We must stop them, and we have it in, the power, in our power to do so. The library of tomorrow should be better than the library of today, not worse. It is not better to have a journal that disappears when you stop subscribing to it. It is not that everyone knows that it's a bug and not a feature, that if one person is reading a book, someone else can't. It is, um, it is a feature and not a bug of ebooks that two people can read them at the same time. It's time we stop pretending that these pirates are right. Um, people in publishing were all readers before they were publishers. Writers were all readers before they were publishers. We are the people of the book, and it's time we started acting like it. Now, in conclusion, I have a simple but radical proposal for you. Stop buying ebooks with DRM on them. Period. I know it's not easy. Librarianship is not easy. Librarianship has never been easy. Ask the people at Alexandria. You are, after all, the specialists who safeguard information in the information age. Access to information has always been a radical political act. But you wouldn't accept a publisher's demand that his representatives could be allowed to put hidden cameras in your collection to discover who was reading which books. You wouldn't accept a publisher's demand for access to your circulation records. You wouldn't accept a journal publisher who said that your physical copies had to be confiscated and burned if you terminated your subscriptions. The digital equivalents are no more acceptable than the physical ones. Now, I said this isn't complicated. That doesn't mean it's not hard. But it's not complicated. Period. Thank you. <laughs>